Light always trumps over darkness. Darkness is always defeated by the light. You think about the sunrise. We had the sunrise service out at UC Health Park this morning. And every morning, the sun defeats the night, defeats the darkness 100% of the time. When you go into your garage, your garage is probably pretty dark. And then what happens? You turn on the lights and the light always wins out. And Jesus is the light of the world. He tells us, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light of the world. And this morning, his light, his love, it penetrates darkness in our lives. We have a spiritual darkness. Before we know Christ as our savior, the Bible tells us we're dead in our sin sins. But when Christ comes into our life, he brings his light, he brings his love, and it's a whole transformation that God brings into our life. And it's awesome to know as believers that it's not God giving us a system of redemption. What do I mean by that? God is not offering rules and regulations. It's his son. We have a savior who is our redeemer. It's not that God is saying, look, you have to try to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. He's offering salvation through grace. And the death and the resurrection of Christ, it brings freedom from sin in our lives as well. We can't overcome sin apart from Christ. So we have a lot to celebrate this morning. There's a lot of news swirling around the world, isn't there? But as believers, our news is the good news. That's what we get to share and that's what we get to celebrate And that's what we get to proclaim. Let's look in verse 33 of Matthew 27. And when they'd come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he would not drink. Christ has been betrayed by Judas. He's been put on trial. He has been convicted of this death sentence to go to the cross They bring Jesus out to the place that's called the skull. Now that's a bad place if it has the name, the skull, Golgotha, because this is the place of execution. This is the place of crucifixion that the Romans chose there in Jerusalem. In verse 35, then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Quoting Psalms 22, 18, and they crucified him. Before the resurrection comes the crucifixion, and this was in the heart and mind of God before even the creation of the world. God knew when he created Adam and Eve that Adam and Eve would sin. He knew that the price that would have to be paid for sin was the blood of his own son. The Old Testament leading up to this point, you see animals sacrificed for sin and animals couldn't take away sin, only cover sin, but it was the innocent sacrifice for sin. And Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away our sin. Jesus died for you. He loves you enough that he went to the cross, that he was crucified for us, nailed his arms, his hands, his feet, nailed to the cross after he's already been beaten. He's been spit upon. His beard has been ripped out. What are the Roman soldiers doing? They're playing games at the foot of the cross. Who's going to get the clothes of Jesus? What game can I get from, from this? And it's easy to play games at the foot of the cross. I I grew up in a Christian family, went to Christian school. And in a lot of ways, I was just playing a game at the feet of my crucified Savior. I didn't realize the weight of what he had done. And thankfully, God was gracious to get a hold of my life. In verse 36, sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put over his head the accusation written against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The Jews didn't agree with this. They didn't acknowledge Jesus as their king. In fact, it was the Jewish leaders that were behind the death of of Christ. But it's true of Christ. He's the King of the Jews. We just sang, all hail King Jesus. And he is the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings. He's the God of the nations, whether we recognize it or not, whether we submit to him or not. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. Jesus gets placed amongst criminals. He's with those that are on death row. And we're going to talk about these two criminals, these two robbers, more in just a moment. 
And those who passed by him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. There's this mockery of Jesus in his most difficult hour where he's being punished for sin. And even those passing by are taking cheap shots at at Jesus. They bring up this this reference to the temple. In John chapter 2, Jesus said, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it in three days. And he was speaking about his body, but they didn't understand that. So they would mock Jesus. So so are you going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? And, And the very core of the mockery to Jesus is his identity. Are you really the son of God? If you're God's son, then, then why would the father let you suffer like this? You, you've saved others. Why don't you save yourself? In verse 41, likewise, the chief priest also mocking with the scribes and the elders said, so the chief priests come to mock Jesus. The elders of Israel come to mock Jesus. He saved others himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. If you are who you claim to be, then get down off of the cross. If if you're really God's son, he will deliver you. You saved others, now save yourself. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now, this is interesting because you've got these two criminals on the right and the left of Jesus. And Matthew tells us that they're both mocking Jesus. But Luke gives us more detail that one of them changed his mind. And he turns to Jesus and says, when you enter into your father's house, will you remember me? And then Jesus said, assuredly, today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, what happened? He changed his mind. He came in with a hard heart toward Jesus. He was joining this mockery of Christ. But as he witnessed the suffering of Christ, he saw the love of God. He acknowledged his own sin, asked for forgiveness. And amazingly, in God's grace, God said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. He never had the opportunity to read his Bible to go to church, to tithe, to to give, to get baptized. It's that free gift of of salvation. We don't have anything to offer God to try to buy or earn salvation. It's this humility, this heart of faith to believe that God loves us, that he died for us. And please hear this, is God allows U-turns. You may be in that place where up until this point, You've had a hard heart towards Christ. You've been a a skeptic. In fact, you are the most shocked that you're at church. You're like, I don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm here. Well, you can change your mind. You you can choose to look at Christ and to see his love and say, I'm going to now choose to believe, even though up until this point, my life has been defined by unbelief or defined by rejection of Christ. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all of the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So this is from about noon to three. When there should be the most light, it's dark. And Jesus faced darkness to in order to bring light to our lives, to bring forgiveness to our lives. What the gospel is, is that Jesus was punished for our sins. God is just, so he has to punish sin, that that just consequence for sin. Paul would write later in the New Testament, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. The weight of my sin, the weight of our sin, just, just in this room, If we were to take the collective sin of all of us, it gets heavy real quick, doesn't it? All of that was placed upon Jesus. But not just our sin, but the sin of the whole world was placed upon Christ. And Christ paid the price for sin. And in this moment, Jesus cries out and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now the Father and the Son, for all of eternity have enjoyed fellowship together. 
But part of the consequence of sin is that fellowship is broken with the Father. To where we can stand confident now that we are loved by God. That we have the unconditional love of God. That we have the promise that God will never leave us or forsake us. Why are we confident of that? Because if it was left up to me, I give God a lot of reason to forsake me. But God promises I'm going to never leave you or forsake you because Jesus went to the cross for me. Jesus paid the price. He went through this hour of suffering and and darkness and shame. Verse 47, some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man's calling for Elijah. I don't know how they got that, but they're like, oh, he must be asking Elijah for help. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come down to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Jesus dies as a champion, as the ultimate warrior. Not with this quiet voice, but he cries out from the cross, suffering. He says, it is finished. It is finished. The price is paid in full. Think of it this way. Maybe there's a a debt that you owe. It's It's a credit card. It's a student loan. It's a car payment. And you pay it off and you get a notice from the creditor. You get, get an email that says paid in full, right? I remember we paid off some student loans after we'd been married and we got this letter in the mail and there was this stamp, you know, this dates us a little bit. And the stamp was actually red ink that said paid in full. It was when you got letters in the mail, right? And I, my wife and I, We're just celebrating. We're thanking the Lord like, woo, this is awesome. No more paying off uh, student loans. And in a far greater way, paid in full. Jesus has paid the price for our sins. Verse 51, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks were split, the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This is far out. You could not deny these events even if you tried. If you're in Jerusalem and minding your own business, doing life with your family, trying to make a profit, whatever, you would have to acknowledge something is going on. It's dark from noon to three. There's this great earthquake When Christ rises from the dead, some saints rise from the dead as well, and they're going around Jerusalem talking about these events. And you're like, wait a second, you're dead. Like, what what happened here? It speaks of the power of the resurrection that, that Christ rises from the dead, and those who believe in Christ will be risen from the dead as well. Did you notice also the veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom? Now, who was the greatest opposition to Jesus? The temple, the chief priests, they're the ones that hated Christ the most, and they're the keepers of the temple, and this veil was to keep people out of God's presence, and that seems strange to us, but God is holy, and only one man one day a year could go into the presence of God, but when Jesus died and paid that price, the veil is torn from top to bottom. If a person was tearing this veil, you'd have to tear it from bottom up. But God toward the veil. God gives us a message and he says, it's open access to my throne room. There's free refills to the throne room of God, right? You can keep coming back to that that throne room of grace because the veil of the temple has been torn in two. In verse 54, so when the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly saying, truly, This was the son of God. This is a rough group, a Roman officer, a centurion, and the officers that are in charge of killing Jesus. They put the nails into Jesus' hands and and his feet. They were the ones playing games at the foot of the cross, joining in probably in the mockery of Jesus. But when they see Jesus die, and they lift their eyes to Christ, This earthquake takes place like truly this was the son of God. I'm sure 
they had seen many die through crucifixion, but none like Jesus. Never heard someone say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And there's this faith that takes place in Christ. In verse 55, and many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. These two Marys are going to be important in chapter 28. And so we turn over to chapter 28 and we look at the resurrection of Christ. And, and what happens after Jesus dies is you have a man, Joseph of Arimathea. We don't know a lot about him, but he decides to go to Pilate and ask for the dead body of Jesus. He risks his life. Jesus has just been killed and crucified and he identifies himself as a follower of Christ and Pilate says, yeah, you can take the, the body of Jesus. And what a difficult thing to do. Your Lord, your Savior, you're, you're taking down his crucified body. His body that is just brutalized and, and having to, to carry him. We know that Nicodemus joined in, in helping to bury Christ. And he puts Jesus in his own tomb that was hewn out of a rock. And there's a stone, a large stone that's been placed on the tomb. And no doubt for the disciples, they're thinking this is, this is the end. The religious leaders, they're afraid of the possibility of the resurrection. They remember that Jesus predicted his own resurrection. So they go to Pilate and say, hey, we need some soldiers to guard the tomb because the disciples might come and try to steal the body of Christ and then claim that Jesus rose from the dead. So verse 1 of chapter 28 now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Sabbath is Saturday. First day of the week for the Jews is always Sunday. It's that way currently. They couldn't come because of the Sabbath on Saturday. So the first day that they can come, first morning light, they're coming to give Jesus a proper burial. And behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear and became like dead men. I've been thinking, how fun would it be to be the angel? You know, <laughs> the father's like, okay, this angel, we don't know which angel he chose. I've got a job for you. My son is rising from the dead. I want you to roll the stone away. When the angel rolls the stone away, Jesus has already risen. He's already left uh, the tomb. The angel gets to be part of the announcement, gets to be part of the dramatic effect, uh, if you would, that Christ has risen from the dead. And this is the greatest moment in human history. This is what defines all of our lives, that Christ is risen from the dead, and this angel gets to roll the stone away and then just kind of sit back on the top. Like, hey, this is, this is great news that Christ has risen from the dead. Think about this tomb, all right? The, the, the tomb is dark, but when the stone is rolled away, light comes into the tomb. And Jesus is the light of the world. And when he came out of the tomb, he steps into our darkness. He steps into our grave. He, he steps into the deadness of our sin and he brings light and he brings love and he brings forgiveness and he brings the power to be able to change our lives. In verse five, but the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. There's really not words to try to understand what a shock this would be to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary because they're expecting that Jesus is going to be inside of this tomb. They don't know that Christ is risen. The angels is gonna try to express that uh, to them. They're expecting to have to try to roll the stone away. What I, I love about these two women is this is a huge obstacle to try to roll the stone, but love doesn't know obstacles. They're like, we're going to find a way to roll this stone because we're going to give Jesus a proper burial. 
But now they hear this news. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. He's risen. He's not here. He's risen from the dead. Notice the emphasis of as he said. Jesus called it. He called it. You know, sometimes in sports, you might try to call your shot. Playing basketball, like, all right, this one's going in. Playing pig or horse. I'm going to sink this shot off the back. It's, it's more impressive if you can call your shot. Think of Babe Ruth, right? Calling the, calling the home run. Jesus called the shot. He's like, I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to rise again the third day. Jesus will be faithful to his promise. Maybe there's challenges, things in our lives that cause uncertainty and doubt. God's going to be faithful to his word. You can anchor yourself in that truth. It will be as God said. Also, the resurrection of Christ proves that Jesus is God. He claimed to be God, but it proves it. A lot of people have claimed to be God, but Jesus backed it up. And he rose from the dead. It's just as he said. They get to examine the tomb and see that Christ is no longer there. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. In the Gospels, when someone encounters the resurrection of Christ, it always comes with the instruction of go and tell. Jesus being raised from the dead is too good a news to keep to themselves. Imagine if Mary and Mary are like, no, you know, We're just not going to tell the rest of the disciples. We're going to keep this to ourselves. We've got the inside track here. No, there's sorrow. There's devastation in the hearts of the disciples. They've got to know the resurrection of Christ. And I suggest to you this morning that the resurrection of Jesus is just too good to keep to ourselves. To be able to share, Christ is is risen. He, He is alive. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy And they ran to bring his disciples' word. Leaving the tomb, they are filled with fear, with awe, with wonder, with respect, and also joy that Christ is risen. And they can't wait to share. They're running to share. In verse 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Jesus is like, Oh, the... I, I got to reveal myself to these two dear women. They're there at my crucifixion. They're coming to the tomb now. I, I, I've got to reveal myself personally to them. And he just kind of stops them on the road and is like, rejoice, right? And that's the message of the resurrection of Christ, is rejoice, to take joy in the fact that Christ is risen. I think a lot of times we think joy is rooted in our circumstances or our emotions. I'm sure some of you are having an emotional response this morning to the resurrection. Praise God. But some of you may not. You're like, honestly, I'm having a really tough morning. I didn't get enough coffee. I know I'm not supposed to be grumpy on Easter, but I am, right? It's like, it's hard to get our families here on resurrection morning. You know, I was feeling for families at the sunrise service. There are these minivans, all these kids pulling out, and <laughs> the kids just don't get the message that Christ is risen. It's like, can't you behave? It's, it's Easter, right? And so we wait for this emotional experience, or we wait for our circumstances to line up. No, we have a living hope because Christ is alive. We have that confident expectation of coming good because Christ is alive, and we can choose to rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. This theme of light over darkness, it's throughout the Bible. In Genesis chapter one, when God creates the world, we see that the world was without form and void and darkness. So it's just darkness, no form, no void. And what happens? First aspect of God's creation, God doesn't do anything on accident. God said, let there be light. That ultimately was a display, an illustration of Jesus, of the gospel. 
that Jesus is the light of the world and he comes to bring light into our lives. Oddly enough, I want to take us to David and Goliath for a moment. You're like, what in the world does David and Goliath have to do with the resurrection? I don't know, but we're going to give it an attempt. So David and Goliath, Goliath's the giant of the Philistines. He is their greatest warrior. The Philistines come and attack in Israel territory, in the Valley of Elah. And you've got the Philistines set up on one side, the Israelites set up on the other. And Goliath gives this proposition and says, look, you send your best fighter, we'll have it out, winner takes all. If you guys defeat Goliath, then we'll be your captives. If Goliath wins, then Israel is the captives. And this is going on for days where Goliath comes out and he trash talks to the children of Israel. And the children of Israel are afraid. All of the soldiers of Israel are afraid and no one's willing to fight Goliath. Now, for sake of illustration, think of Goliath as darkness. And there's a lot of darkness in our culture, in our society, in our city, but there's also a lot of darkness in our own lives. And I really feel like right now in human history, Goliath is really loud. You get what I'm saying? Like darkness is, is really loud. And it's easy for us as believers to start looking at each other in discouragement and fear going, man, I'm not going to take on Goliath. Me neither. I'm just going to stay here and have my Americano. Like there, there's just, there's nothing that I can do. And, and Goliath just has his way continuing to shout out discouragement to God's people. Well, here comes a young shepherd boy and he happened to be working for DoorDash. <laughs> his job was to bring the food. He, he was bringing Chick-fil-A to his brothers because it's the Lord's chicken, right? So he's, he's bringing Chick-fil-A. Probably more like cheese and ham, but I guess not ham because they're Jewish, right? So... <laughs> But anyway, he's, he's bringing the food to his brothers and he's overhearing Goliath and he's saying, no, wait a second. Hey, this doesn't settle with me. I, I'm not going to settle for darkness. I'm not going to settle for Goliath to be able to, to have his way. This is about God's glory. And somebody needs to take this knucklehead on so that people see that there's a living God amongst the children of Israel. And this starts to travel, and ultimately they take David to Saul. And Saul, I don't know what Saul's thinking, but he's like, I guess we'll send a teenage boy out there. They, they, they asked for our champion. All we got's this redhead. You know, let's, let's send the runt out there that his job is to bring the food, but hey, go, go for it. And ask David to take on his armor. And, and David's like, no way, I this is way too big. It doesn't fit. I don't know how to use it. I'm just going to go out there with my slingshot and my five smooth stones. And instead of running away from darkness, he approaches darkness and allows light to have the triumph. We've got one stone. You know what it is? The resurrected Savior. The stone has been rolled away. So we don't have to run from darkness in our culture. Not prideful or arrogant, but we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to run from darkness in our own lives. We can stand strong for the glory of God because of our resurrected Savior. If you know Christ as your Savior, one of the promises of the gospel, of the good news, is also the power of sin is broken in our lives. We have forgiveness of sin, but also the power of sin that's been broken. Because sometimes as believers, unfortunately, we start to flirt with darkness again. We start to dwell too much in darkness, and then we accept that defeat. We're like, well, I guess I'm always going to be angry like this. I'm always going to be in sexual sin. I'm, I'm always going to be in bitterness. There, there's no way uh, for victory. And I believe the heart of God saying, no, look what my son did for you. He died and he rose again to call us out of darkness. Peter writes and says that God has called us into marvelous light. In 1 John, we're told that we can live in the light, that we're children of the light 
And as we're in the light, we have fellowship with God and we have fellowship with one another. As God's children, are we saying, you know what? There just seems like there's something missing in my relationship with Jesus. There's not a closeness. There's not an intimacy. It's not that we've lost our salvation. It's that we can't be close with God the way that God would intend. You know, Amber and I, if I sin against my wife and I don't deal with it and I don't confess it and ask for her forgiveness, that fellowship is not going to be as close as it could because of the sin. And thankfully, we're still married and she hasn't left me, but it's like, no, things aren't right. We've all felt that. And then our relationship with God, he loves us enough to say, you know what, Eric, you got to deal with this. I'm not just going to pretend like everything's okay. And the Bible calls it confession. And 1 John tells us, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What if this morning, this was not just an Easter service where we check off a box, but we meet with our risen Savior, where we allow God to speak to us, and instead of living in discouragement of the darkness of our culture, discouragement of the darkness in our own lives, we allowed God's light to shine afresh in our lives and said, Lord, here it is. I'm not gonna hide anymore. There's something about sin and darkness where it brings shame and it's like, I don't want anybody to know. We can't hide. God loves us too much for that and so we can bring it to the Lord this morning. So this is what we're gonna do is Billy's gonna come and and lead us in a song. I've asked him to play a song called The Gospel is Rest. I asked him if he'd do it on Friday. Today's Sunday. and he, He learned it that quick. But this song's just really been speaking to to my heart. That's the message of the gospel, is the gospel provides rest, provides forgiveness of sin. There's weights that we're trying to carry that only God can carry that he wants us to surrender to him. There's there's things in my life that I've been trying to carry and God's been challenging me. Eric, you need to surrender those to me. That's why this song has been speaking to me so much. And then after the song, We're going to open up the front of the sanctuary. In my church growing up as a kid, there were times where they would just open up the front of the sanctuary as a place to respond to the Lord, as an altar to meet with with God. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to come down here in the front as a believer if there's burdens that you need to lay down or there's darkness in your life and you're saying, you know what, I am sick of it. I bet for some of you this morning, you're crying out to Jesus and you're like, you know what? I am sick of this darkness in my life. If Christ is risen, I need to experience him. I need to to draw near to him. And I know it's a bold move, but after this song to to come down and to spend time with the Lord, we're going to pray together. I'm going to pray with you. We're going to ask that God would do a work and relieve those burdens and set us free of darkness. But then also, if you don't know Christ as your savior, to come and trust Christ. Time is short, and Jesus loves you. Now, I'm going to ask something that I don't know that I've asked too much in the past, is let's give this next few moments to the Lord. Because when God speaks, man, it's powerful. And the risen Savior, he wants to speak to our hearts. So if you get a text on your phone, just ignore it, right? If you got to go to the bathroom, just hold it. You know, we'll be done in a few moments. But let's be still before the Lord and allow God to to speak to us. So, Jesus, we thank you that you have provided grace, that you've provided forgiveness of sin. The power of sin is broken in our lives, that you're risen. Lord, and as, as Billy sings this song, would you speak to our hearts afresh? Lord, would you do a work in us this morning? We want to hear from you. 